today, we're in Galesburg, Illinois, a town home to one of BNSF's largest rail yards and the Southern Transcon, one of the nation's most vital rail lines. Between the six subdivisions feeding the massive yard and the high volume Transcon, I reckon this town sees somewhere around 200 trains each day. This place really is a rail fan's paradise. The sheer variety and volume of trains passing through here is nearly unmatched anywhere else on the continent. So today, let's check out Galesburg, Illinois' busiest railroad town short of Chicago. We start off at the 4th Street Bridge, where one of Galesburg's absolutely massive yard movements is just pulled out onto the lead tracks. The north end of this yard has some of the most extreme flat switching you'll ever see. All these yard movements are at least a mile long, and they're pulled by either a single special duty engine, or one of the two SD40-2 and TEBC6 mother slug duos. The locomotives that build and switch outbound trains here are called trimmer units. When these trimmers finish building the train, it's almost never on the right departure track, so they have to pull it all the way out onto the yard leads, have the yard master remotely align the appropriate switches, and shove it all the way back onto the correct classification slash departure tracks, which there are almost 30 of. These yard movements are actually complete mixed freights ready for departure. And after they're stopped, road engines will be hooked up, a symbol will be assigned by dispatch, and the complete freight train will be ready to get a move on. On the other side of the bridge, we see some power shoving back into the mechanical section of the yard, which is all the tracks surrounding the locomotive shops, fuel pads, and wheel true building. On top of the two BNSF war bonnets, there's also a PRLX SD40-3 MR demonstrator at the end. Because these engines don't have any issues, they'll be parked at the north end of mechanical with the rest of Galesburg's usable power, after being topped off with fuel and sand at the r, &R tracks except for the SD40-3. That's dead in tow. Once all the switches were clear, a Chicago-bound local freight made its departure, with an even more impressive lash up on the head end. Interestingly, BNSF is not continuing their AC-44 rebuild program. Instead, Santa Fe war bonnets will be used as is until they can't be used anymore, which is rather bittersweet. On one hand, we'll be able to see authentic ATSF war bonnets for years to come, but on the other, we'll have no choice but to watch as BNSF lets these living pieces of history rot away into uselessness, unless one gets preserved, which is not out of the realm of possibility. Also, don't expect to see 686 and 644 on the main line anytime soon. Just a couple weeks after this video was taken, BNSF put them on one of the hump sets in the yard. These local runs were just mechanical tests to make sure the locomotives are working properly. Today, all three of the hump sets at Galesburg have ATSF war bonnets on them, and the same can be said for Northtown up in Minnesota. Unfortunately, Hump service will likely be the last assignment these red and silver beauties ever see before they're either sold or scrapped.
After that, we head over to Peck Park, where we see LCHI 103 headed north on the Barstow sub. We'll see more at 334 in the next video, so for now, let's focus on 2284. Not only is it incredibly rare for an old BN engine to still have its original number, but its old logo is also starting to poke through. I think it's quite neat that the patches on these old fallen flags are starting to fade away, because now we get to see them as they were intended to look almost 30 years ago. Before leaving the yard, we catch a transfer train headed west on the Peoria sub, with not one, but two blue bonnets in the lash-up. This mixed freight was made by the Taswell and Peoria Railroad, who interchanged it with BNSF earlier in the day. One thing you may notice is that 1755's number has been restored to the exact font and colors it would have been on the Santa Fe, and it's hand painted, meaning BNSF certainly didn't do this. I like to call this kind of work anti-graffiti, meaning the subject has been graffitied for the better. Since this is a cosmetic restoration on an Illinois-based Santa Fe engine, it makes me wonder if this work was done by the same group who restored 552's long hood. Now, we move over to the ever-busy Southern Transcon. It was about 6.30 in the morning when I took this footage, but we're up this early for a good reason, because there's a very special locomotive coming down the line. On this train is one of, if not the most iconic BNSF oddball engine. It's 7695, the one and only Golden Swoosh, which I've been after for about two years now. The Golden Swoosh was one of the first locomotives to wear BNSF's Swoosh logo, which made its debut in 2006. Unsurprisingly, the yellow livery on an orange background made things hard to read, especially at a distance, so the color of the logo was quickly changed to black, leaving 7695 as the only engine to wear this failed experimental paint scheme. Just a few minutes later, another intermodal came through, with an ever-rare Executive Mac in the last ship. Since the days of BN, it's always been uncommon to see these on anything but coal drags, because their AC propulsion system makes them excellent pullers for high tonnage trains. Interestingly, Burlington Northern was very stingy with their Macs, as they almost never let them leave as foreign power.
now we know why that heavy haul Mac is on the head end. This intermodal is a mega train, likely stretching close to three miles long with more than 200 cars. Mega trains exist as a way to keep traffic on the rails to a minimum and cut costs by having one crew operate what is essentially two trains. However, they're extremely unwieldy as there's almost no sidings big enough to accommodate them and they beat up the rails pretty good because they're so heavy and so long. Of course, how could we visit Galesburg without stopping by the locomotive shops? Our first catch here is a brand new SD23 T4 with an absolutely ridiculous looking radiator. Tier 4 technology requires excessive cooling so the engine can run more efficiently, therefore producing less harmful compounds in the exhaust. Also, these SD23 T4s have a GE inline 6 engine. Inline sixes haven't been used in full-scale locomotives for quite some time, so it's pretty neat to see this more than reliable engine design making a comeback. Speaking of CSX, we also see several high horsepower Dash 8s on their way back to GE. With big road engines such as these entering the surplus market, we're starting to see a shift in short line mode of power. Previously, EMD power was just about all short lines had, except for some outliers such as Pickens. But now, big road engines such as Dash 8s and Dash 9s are starting to appear on Class 2 and 3 railroads across the nation, which is wonderful because these are extremely reliable locomotives with lots of life left in them. Also, 7376 is an old CNO sticker unit. One of the rarest locomotives you can find, even on its home tracks, would be a BC Blueberry. My Canadian National Rail fans tell me that any BC Rail Dash 9 in original paint is extremely difficult to come across, because most have been stored, scrapped, or repainted. Due to the fact that BC Rail was a smaller Class 2 line, they only had 14 Dash 9s to begin with, which makes seeing one in any capacity almost 20 years after their acquisition by CN simply incredible. Another elusive fallen flag would be Illinois Central, Today, just about all that's left of them are their Death Star SD-70s, along with some yard power. But have you ever seen a Death Star SW-14? Several veteran rail fans who live in the heart of Canadian National Territory have told me they've never even seen one of these before, so heaven only knows how many are left. And if this single locomotive wasn't enough for you, there was also an SW-10 coupled to it. Union Pacific was the only railroad that made these almost 50 years ago, and today they're quite the dying breed. If you would like to see one of these elusive SW10s in action, check out this video where we see one switching industry in Peoria. And finally, the locomotives all y'all came to see, Norfolk Southern's newest take on maintenance away mode of power. Now, why did NS take two Dash 9s and turn them into giant Triclops cow units instead of just repainting the existing locomotives in a designated MO scheme, which has been done countless times in the past. As per usual with the railroad, these modifications are a cost-cutting measure. Because these Dash 9s have been so heavily modified, and because they're not going to be working in revenue service, they barely count as locomotives in the FRA's eyes meaning NS does not have to provide a real train crew to man these things. These will almost certainly be operated by Gandy Dancers. However, this is Mo service we're talking about, so these engines won't be going too fast or too far under their own power. Basically, these engines fall into the same category as the motive power on Herzog's multi-purpose machine, which has been operating without real train crews for years and has seen massive success. Are these the prettiest thing to look at? No, but I do like the new paint scheme, and it's super neat to see a modern cow unit. The last time we saw a design even remotely similar to this was with the C40-8Ms. Keep your eyes peeled, Norfolk Southern Rail fans, because you've got a better chance than anyone to see two of the most unique Dash 9s ever created.
Thanks for watching. Be sure to tune in next time, because there's still more oddballs, more war bonnets, and maybe even a heritage unit or two to be seen. Also, maybe pass yourself by the merch shop. Anyways, till next time.